It says, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. Children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might be plain that they are not at all of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. That what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who try to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would allow this sermon, through this sermon, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, God, would you be at work in all of us to transform us this hour, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, on May 6, 1994, two very important things happened in my life. Uh, the first is that I became an older brother. My little brother Chris Linkus was born, and so my life changed forever. The second thing actually didn't affect me a whole lot, but effect, has affected many, many more people since then. And it's that on that same day, May 6th, 1994, the channel opened between England and France. Now, if you don't know what the channel is, it's a tunnel that goes underground 30 miles between England and France, underneath the ocean. Okay, so wrap your mind around that for just a moment. It's about 150 feet below the ground at the bottom of the ocean and about 300 feet from the surface level at ocean, uh, the ocean sea level. Now, I don't know about you, but the prospect of getting on a train and riding underneath the ocean for 30 miles, that doesn't excite me too much. However, 20 million people a year, 20 million people a year take this route. That's 55,000 people every single day. Something has given these people assurance that if they get on the train in England or in France and they cross, they cross the English Channel, they will get to the other side unharmed. Before you or I, if we were to take a journey on the channel, before we step on an elevator, get on an airplane, or drive over a bridge, we want assurance that whenever we get on, we will be able to get off on the other side. And thankfully, civil engineers have done a lot of calculating to make sure that we can make all these journeys safely and consistently. But assurance is something that we long for in many different areas of life. Right? We want to know, if I choose this decision over another, is it the right one? <coughs> right? Should we hire this person or that one? Should I take this job or that one? Is now the right time to retire or should I wait a little bit longer? We go and we should we crunch the numbers, we consult everyone we know, maybe not everyone, but at least the people we trust, because we want to be assured that it's the right move. We want to be assured and be confident. Right? Whenever you make a decision to marry someone, you want to be assured that you're marrying the right person, and that one, ten, and fifty years from now, that you're still going to love them and they're going to love you. But assurance is also something that we look for in the Christian life. Namely, assurance of our salvation. Right? One of the things that we believe, because the Bible teaches it, is that we are saved by faith and not by works. And that means that there's no physical marker that I can go get, there's no 
mark I can put on my body that would designate me, well, you are now officially saved, right? It's not as if you go down into the baptismal waters with one color of hair, and we all come up with the same color afterwards. That's not how it works. And so we wonder at times, because there's no physical marker, how can I really be sure? How can I really be sure that I'm saved? That I'm going to inherit eternal life? Maybe the answer is to be baptized. Right? We are commanded to be baptized, so maybe if you really want to be sure, you get baptized again. Right? There was, when I was growing up, there was one youth in my church who, by the time he was 18 years old, had been baptized six times. Right? And I think, I think in, in his own heart, when he had, every time that he had maybe strayed a little bit or had, you know, had, had made an error, I think he felt like maybe I wasn't genuine the first time. So I need to do the whole thing over again, and I'll just make sure, right? I'll make sure I'm sealed in this way. But in the Bible, people are only baptized one time. So baptism isn't necessarily the best badge of, well, are we really saved, right? We believe you need to have faith, right? And it's not as if people, after their baptism, after they come to faith, it's not as if they're perfect. We all continue to make mistakes. However, if you have baptized and repented of your sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or maybe one thing we should do is we shouldn't be baptized again. Maybe we should just scrutinize ourselves. Did I really mean it the first time? Did I really, really mean it? Did I really, 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 really mean it when I said that I believe in Jesus Christ? Is my faith true? Is it authentic? And Think that this too, we got to be careful about this because at some point we are going to be able to trust ourselves, and really the basis of our faith is not on ourselves at all, it's on Jesus. But we need to be we need to know where we can find assurance, and it's important because if not, some huckster is going to come along and they're going to tell you if you do this thing, if you give money to this cause, then yeah, you can be sure that you are a Christian, right? And that's early 1500s, the church at Rome was trying to raise funds to build a new basilica, and so they sent their preachers out to the churches and got them to contribute. And they, what they did to raise money is they sold what were called indulgences, and it said that if you purchase this indulgence, then we will remit your sin. We will give you a certificate, a piece of paper, and it says that your sins have been forgiven. Right? The phrase they said is, when the coin of the copper rings, the soul from purgatory springs. That was what was taught. And it was this week, on October 31st, 1517, 502 years ago, that a German priest named Martin Luther took 95 theses and nailed them to the Wittenberg door, the church of, the, the church of Wittenberg, and it, and it opened with this. When our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, said, repent, he will, that the entire life of believers be one of repentance. It's not that we're just given one chance, and that if we sin after that, then we're faith, but rather we are justified by faith alone, and we repent of our sins every day. That's why every week we come and we pray a prayer of confession. It's not because, well, I sinned this past week and now my salvation is lost. It's because we do sin and we just need to confess that to the Lord, knowing that he offers forgiveness. Martin Luther helped recover what's called the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You read about this in the Bible. And it means that it doesn't matter what we do, there's no work that we need to do, there's no bar that we must achieve in order to be saved from our sins, to be declared right in the eyes of God. And again, this also means that our justification by faith isn't for us to focus on the strength of our faith, it's to focus on the object of our faith, namely Jesus Christ. Because I trust him, that's what the basis of my salvation is. This is what the gospel entails. And as we fly the flag of justification by faith, as we proclaim the gospel to the world, we might think that as long as anybody anywhere says that they believe in Jesus, that they've crossed the bar, they have made the threshold of being a true believer. Right? And maybe they even have it on a piece of paper somewhere. Someone wrote them a certificate, or maybe they're on a church roll somewhere. However, you know, they may not go to church that often. You know, I think as long as I show up a couple times a year, try to be a good person, that's probably all I need. Yeah, because I believe in Jesus. But this is a form of easy believism that justification by faith is not trying to put out in the world. This, it's not actually what justification by faith means. 
It changes again to what Jesus himself taught. In the Sermon on the Mount, as he's closing that sermon, one of the things Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 21 and 23 is this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Right, just because you call yourself a Christian, just because you may be a member at a church and you try to be a good person, none of these will guarantee that you're a true follower of Jesus who can have assurance. And I don't say all these things today to get anyone in the room to doubt their assurance. That's not, what I'm, that's not my aim. And the, the fact of the matter is the book of 1 John was actually written to us for this very purpose, so that we might have assurance. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know that you have eternal life. And so today as we focus on 1 John 2, I want to focus on two kind of marks of assurance that can assure us in our faith. Two tests. And the heart of the message today is this, that believers demonstrate their love for God and their true faith by holding fast to true teaching about Jesus Christ and by continuing in the fellowship of the church. I'm going to say that one more time. Believers demonstrate their love for God and, the true, and their true faith by holding fast to true teaching about Jesus Christ and by continuing in the fellowship of the church. Well, the first test of authentic faith in Jesus, it's a, it's a social test in our passage today. Namely, the test of Christian fellowship. Look at verses 18 and 19 in 1 John 2. It says, children, it is the last hour, and as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Because if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out. That it might be plain that they are all not of us. Now, I know the first thought you were thinking likely is Antichrist. Pastor Ryan, you change subjects very fast. However, it's, it's all related, and I want us to focus on the word just for a minute, Antichrist, and what, what John means here. All right, the word Antichrist in the Bible only appears in 1 John and 2 John, and it doesn't refer to this really bad figure at the end of the age before, you know, Jesus returns and the world ends. That's not what the word Antichrist means. Rather, it is someone who is anti-Christ. That is, they are against the Messiah. Therefore, there's not just one antichrist, but there can be many. Anyone who is against the Messiah can be considered an antichrist. And the presence of antichrist, someone who is against the Messiah, later on we'll see someone who denies the Father and the Son, is that their presence demonstrates that the last hour is here. Right? Little children, it is the last hour. Uh, and the reason we know is because Antichrist has come. And again, this phrase, the last hour, and maybe you see in some Bible translations, the final days. Again, it's not saying that, you know, you know, everyone look at your clocks because Jesus is coming back in two hours. What it means is that uh, the time between when Jesus ascended into heaven and his return are the final days. It means it's the era of the consummation of God's promises to the church. We expect Jesus to return someday. But nevertheless, we live in the last days. We live, again, anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. And there are many ways in which we can tell if someone is for Christ or against him. But one indication is whether or not they continue in the fellowship of the church. All right, they went out of us, but they were not of us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. The absence of those who were formerly a part of the church indicates that perhaps they never truly belonged. In the immediate context, John is he's here referring to false teachers, but the application extends far beyond that. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because I really think it's important. This is a salvific issue. Right? And it concerns two things, two doctrines. One is the doctrine of the church, and the other one is the doctrine of perseverance. The first is that of the church. What, what is the church? Right? We just finished a series a few weeks ago called The Church According to Jesus through the book of Ephesians. I'm pretty sure we all know the church is not a building, right? But it's a group of people. And the Bible refers to the church as the body of Christ. 
the household of faith, the people of God. It is that which the gates of Hades will not prevail against. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 18. The Greek word for church, you may have heard it before, it is called ekklesia, ekklesia. And it's at its root meaning, it means a gathering of people, right? Even before the New Testament was written, people were referring to ecclesias, and what they were were groups of people who gathered and met. And so whenever the, after, after Jesus came and his disciples started to gather and meet, they called themselves an ecclesia. We are the church, and then they started using that term with more heft, more weight. But it nearly always refers to, and when I say nearly always, I'm thinking 95% of the time or more in the New Testament, it refers to a gathered body of believers who gathered to worship Jesus Christ in a specific location. And this is important because one of the things it means to be a member of the church is that you gather with the church. Right? Church members join in a local gathering and they commit to the work of God in their location together. They gather together for worship, they contribute financially to the cause of the church, and they labor together in the ministry of the church for the gospel. And this is one reason I'm burdened for those who are inactive members in our church. As, as I mentioned last week, we have over 850 people who are members of our church, but they're inactive. They've not been around in a long time. And some people have good excuses why. They may have moved away years ago and found another church, but we never got word. Or maybe they passed away, and we don't know about that. There are some who care for sick family members for years and years and years and don't have the opportunity to come to church. But there are many who become inactive simply because they just don't show up. They just don't come. And this is a lack of even the most basic responsibility of what it means to be a member of the church, to be a member of the body of Christ, which is to gather weekly to worship Jesus. At the very least, it tells us that there's not much concern for the command in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that we forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Right? And as far as 1 John 2, 19 is concerned in our passage here, their absence may demonstrate that they were never of us to begin with. Right? They may be a member of the visible church that we can see, we can look at their name on a list somewhere, but they're really not a member of the invisible church, the spiritual fellowship of true believers all around the world. And you might say, but what about eternal security? You know, I've seen people make genuine professions of faith, at least it seemed genuine in the moment. They repented of their sins. So are you saying that they lost their salvation? What about once saved, always saved? And I would say, it depends on what you mean by the phrase. Right? The formal name for this doctrine is called the perseverance of the saints. And its basic meaning is that if you have been saved by God, it doesn't matter what else happens in your life. If you've been justified by His grace, there's nothing that anyone else or anything else in the world can do to take that away from you, right? It's based on the teaching of First John chapter, or sorry, not First John, the Gospel of John, chapter ten, verses twenty-seven to thirty. My sheep hear my voice. This is Jesus speaking. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. No one and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And this should be a tremendous encouragement to us. However, I th and again, I think it means that it doesn't matter what happens in our life, God will hold on to us. But it's sometimes, if we're not careful whenever we hear the phrase, once saved, always saved, or eternal security, we might think, well, I've been saved, I've been baptized, so now it doesn't really matter what else I can do, because no one can take my salvation away from me. I'll just go live my life. The danger of this is, is it shows that the person never really understood what the call of discipleship Jesus issued was. Namely, that we die to ourselves daily, take up our cross and follow Jesus. I think that there are many people in the, in the world, right, particularly here in the South, who have some type of a connection to church, who are in danger of living under the false pretense that just because of that fact they're going to heaven. They have a false assurance of salvation. Right? Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they were baptized at some point. Or maybe someone in their family is a Christian. And so that includes them. But I fear that these people may get to that final day and stand before Jesus and look at him and 
hear Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you. And they'll say, but Lord, Lord, didn't you know? I was a member of the church. Did, didn't you know? Right, I've tried to be just as good of a person as I could be. The question we have to ask ourselves is, will these suffice? And, and I say this not because I am the judge of who will or who will not get into heaven. That's Jesus' responsibility, not mine. However, the Bible does call us, if we are Christians, it calls us to judge one another, to encourage one another. Right? The Bible commands me and all other believers to judge those who are of the household of faith. Right? Paul, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, For what have I to do with judging outsiders, that is, those outside the church, making moral judgments upon them? Is it not those who are on the inside who you are to judge? God judges those outside. Don't worry about them. But purge the evil person from among you. So if, if someone does call himself or herself a Christian, someone is able to call himself a member of the church, it is our responsibility to walk alongside them, to exhort them, and to encourage them. Right? We play a role in one another's perseverance. Right? Pastor John Piper, who I uh, really enjoy his writings. He said it this way, eternal security is a community project. Eternal security is a community project. Namely, that our perseverance, our making it to the finish line and preserving to the end is based upon other brothers and sisters whom God has given to us. God is still at work in this, encouraging us and making sure that we make it to the finish line. Right, in the past, I, I don't know what's happened here at Dillon. In the past, it was very common for churches to have visitation programs. And those aren't as common as they used to be. But pretty soon, we're going to do some training on how we can go reclaim some of our inactive church members. Remember? And this is a ministry of mercy. It's not a ministry of anger. It's not a ministry of pitying others. But it's a ministry of mercy. Right, Jesus reclaimed the lost sheep, and so should we, the wandering sheep. Right? So if someone is out of church for a few weeks, a couple months, someone is out of church for a year, we should be knocking on their door. Hey, we miss you. Is everything okay? We want you back in the fellowship. We need you back here. And again, I think this is a, it's a spiritual concern. And it's one that the Bible brings to us. So the first issue is the, te the necessity of Christian fellowship. The necessity of Christian fellowship. The second is this. The necessity of true belief. Do we really believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is, is it, and is it the true gospel? See, Christianity, we kind of live on two fronts at times. So on one front, we have those who just are not Christians. They don't profess to be Christians. They don't want to be Christians. And so we have to take the gospel to them and show, how does the gospel interact with your atheism? Or with your Islam? With your Judaism? With your Hinduism? How does the gospel interact with that? And how can we tell you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? But on the other front... There are those who call themselves Christians, but who deny key Christian teaching. Right? There are commonly known cults and sects that distort what the Bible says about Jesus. There are people who you might see on TV who are teaching things about Jesus that are frankly not true. I, I saw a, um, a video the other day of Paula White, who's a very famous televangelist right now. She was talking to someone, and she made a passing comment about someone about Jesus being the only begotten Son of God and then someone said, but hold the phone there Paula, Jesus is not the only begotten Son of God because I'm the Son of God and you're a Son of God we are all, son, we are all the only begotten Son of God and she said, you know what, you're right this is denying the unique relationship that Jesus has with the Father Jesus is the only begotten Son, and you and I become sons and daughters in that relationship by adoption. Uh, we don't have the same relationship to God that Jesus does, but it's through Jesus that we can know God. So let me read verses 20 to 21 of us. This is the necessity of true belief. It says, You have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write this to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because there is no lie in the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Right? The true believer is the one who holds fast to Jesus and confesses him as the only begotten Son of God. Why? We are those who believe that 
God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to earth to become a human for your sake and for mine, to live a perfect life and to die on the cross for our sins and to raise again from the dead three days later. And now he has ascended to the Father's right hand and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is what we believe. And we also confess that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. If people start denying these things, then they're showing that they are against Jesus Christ. Well, John concludes our passage today in the same place that I want to conclude as well, in verses 24 to 29. Namely, he focuses on the promise that we have for those who continue to believe and to continue to hold fast to the truth. It says, let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning does abide in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything that is true and is no lie, just as he has taught you, Abide in him, remain in him, stay in Jesus. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we might have confidence and not shrink back from him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. If we abide in Jesus Christ, if we remain in him, if we don't go pursuing others who would draw us away, and we also abide in the Father and the Son. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's only by doing this that we can have confidence. That we don't have to fear whenever he comes. Later on in 1 John, he'll say, There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. And that we can know the God who is love. And this changes our posture toward God and toward worship. Let, let me ask you a question. Why are you here this morning? Why are you here this morning? Why are you at church? And why do you keep coming back if you've been here a while? Ultimately, I hope your answer is that you're here to worship God. Sometimes we think about the church as a place where we come to receive some service or a commodity. It's a place that aligns with my social preference. I like the people there. They're kind of like me, so I'll go with them. Maybe I like a certain... Bible study or something there. And if we're honest, even the person among us with the purest motives has some of those there as well. I don't want to, I don't say that because they're all bad. But I really hope that the key essence, that the thing that has brought us here today is God himself. All right, if there's one thing that will keep you coming back on the days when you're not feeling up to it, on the days when you're discouraged or you've had a disagreement, or you may not have the same amenities that you had before. You come back because you want to commune with God and worship. You want to hear from his word. It's worshiping God for God's sake. And if I need to be a part of the church body, if I need to gather together with believers because this is what Jesus has commanded me to do, if I need to gather to commune with him, then that's where I'll be because I want to abide in God and in Christ. As I close today, I want us to all, I want to close in a time of prayer for those who are not here this morning. And again, I said this last week, I'm going to keep saying it. I'm not talking about those who aren't feeling well, maybe for today, or maybe they've been ill for a long time and they're not able to join us. I'm not talking about those who are home, home bound. I'm talking about those who could be here this morning, but for whatever reason or not, I want you to think about who those people might be. You've got someone in your mind. I want you to think about them and start praying now about how you might engage that person and invite them to come back. And it's not just for the sake of us. It's not just for the sake of our own ministries and programs, but rather it's for their sake and the sake of God. So they might know God. But we all have people, whether they're in our family, whether they're our neighbors, whether they're our coworkers. We all know people who could be here. We all know people who should be here. Some of their names are on our church roll. So as I close today, let's go and let's bring them before the Lord and pray for them. If you would, let's please bow your heads with me.
Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you that you have given us a book like 1 John so that we might know that we have eternal life if we believe in Jesus Christ. God, we pray now for those who are burdened for, those, God, who have been here in the past, and for whatever reason, some reasons may be good, some reasons may be bad, but for whatever reason, they've fallen out of fellowship with the church. And it's not just that they're not with us, they're not with anybody today, gathering to hear from you, to commune with you, to worship you. God, we pray now that your spirit would begin to stir in the hearts and souls of these people who are not with us today. God, that is our, it is our desire that they would join us and that they would be welcomed back because, God, you as the chief shepherd, the shepherd who pursues the wandering sheep, you welcomed them back, and, God, you welcomed us back. So, God, would you help us to remember the good salvation that you have provided in this way? God, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, who doesn't have a relationship, who's never believed, repented of their sins, and been baptized, God, I ask that you would do a work in their heart, even now. God, that your Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin. Because it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you sang earlier, only by the blood of the Lamb that our sins can be washed, and that we washed away, and that our road can be made white as snow. So God, would you be with us this week? Would you restore us, restore those to fellowship who are not here? And we pray all these in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.